In terms of what is funk, I mean, I think the longer one attenuates themselves with said genre, if you want to call it that, it's more than that, but the longer one attenuates themselves with such a thing, the harder it is to maybe describe what that is. I think that maybe 10 years ago, I would have had a whole bunch of diatribes, and you know, all, I'm not going to say all the ones that you always hear or read in the magazines, the one, okay, we all know about the one, the backbeat, okay, we get it essentially, but I think there's so much more to it than that. It touches the soul of what a lot of us musicians think of as uh, feel music or energy music. It definitely feeds into a certain, um, something inside of us instinctual, something inside of us more deeply rooted. And for those who don't know the history, because it is an American art form, is uh, is deeply rooted in the African American tradition of music and much like the blues is very old maybe older than we give credit to a lot of people start funk with like cold sweat stuff like that james brown mid 60s late 60s then other people talk talk about new orleans funk uh, people talk about lewis jordan who was a sax player who played what a lot of modernists would call jazz but what he called funk doesn't it kind of matter what they call it what they write you know so uh its definition has borders that are not very constrained. It's very free in that aspect. But to call it free is definitely not necessarily the right thing, especially for those of us who've played in large funk ensembles with you know, band, band leaders, famous band leaders like Mr. George Clinton, or of course, James Brown, and so on and so forth. Free isn't necessarily the right word for it. So it has a form, the form is very important, but what that form has meant has transcended different things, much like Bach's music is transcendent, and I think Bernie gets a lot of his stuff, got a lot of his stuff from Bach. This music is also transcendent, so it has its own way with a number of different genres, but when you hear funk, let's say Funkadelic, playing that genre, you know, okay, yes, it's country, yes, it's gospel, yes, it's blues, it's psychedelia, it's doo-wop, it's hip-hop, it's R&B, whatever. But it's P-Funk playing, and there's a vibe to that. There's something you feel instinctively, not just on the records, but when you see the band live. And of course, that has changed over the years as well, because you're talking about a group that's been around almost 64 years. And I think people lose sight of that. I'm not saying we've all been in this band 64 years. We're not as old as what I'm saying. But I'm just <laughs> saying that we have been, this band has existed for that long, for about that long roughly, something like that, and uh, has transcended many different things. So what it means to play funk music can mean many different things, and what it means to play P-Funk can mean many different things, but it's not, it is both very easily definable and impossible to define. And <laughs> the gray area is always stronger than one side or the other. So uh, we're gonna keep playing some more music for you guys, but I just wanted to say hello and thank you so much again for coming out. A lot of people, when they this hear funk music, they're like, oh, it's a lot more rock than I thought. Yeah. It's like, well, well funk is, uh, to call it just rock, yeah, it's got rock in it, or what you would consider rock. Or maybe it, the genre ran parallel to rock, and it also has loud guitars. There's a few different ways you could look at it, you know, but it definitely has that. Funkadelic was always the kind of more experimental feel, a little more political, and definitely more guitar-dominated, where Parliament was more horns 
And although they definitely talk about social things on problem now, they would mask it under concept and kind of do it with a real visceral kind of cerebral way. Uh, but both, actually both bands are very cerebral in a lot of ways. It's called both bands, it's the same band, but the sound, the feel, things change. Uh, we're gonna keep going, but um, I just wanna do those things do some more for you. The health thing is the most important thing. George does like from 100 to 120 shows a year, you know? So you're gonna get beat down. You know, a lot of it is uh, traveling and that, hurts after a while, you know. It's, it's a glamorous life, but it's a rough life, you know. So I just try to do my best with staying as healthy as I can. It's hard to eat right on the road. It's ridiculous. Like Blackbird is a vegetarian. You know, Danny can't eat dairy. You know, so you got a lot of things that you have to consider once you come out on the road. Benzel is a, a big, a uh, vegetable man, you know, he gets his energy, you know, it's like, we stopping in these truck stops, they don't have all of that stuff, <laughs> you know, and so you just do the best you can, and like Bird said, we're glad that we're just still here to talk about it, <laughs> you know, and health does play a big part of it, so thank you for that question, because it's very important that everybody knows how hard it is for us to stay healthy. You know, you hear about the drug cases and the people falling down, but, you know, the immune system is delicate. You can't keep beating it up, you know. Drinking and drugs over the time takes its toll on you. So, you know, it's just best. As you get older, you get wiser, hopefully, you know. <laughs> you, know can you, you know, I feel like the shows that I felt the best about playing were the ones where I was teetering somewhere between the most control I've ever had in my life and falling completely off a cliff. And, if, and improvisation for me is exactly the same thing. If I can stay on that extremely, just like challenge myself to the point where I know I'm gonna do something stupid, and then the thing, the stupid thing might be the best part of it. Be like, oh, that was amazing. I like that. I like that movie. And then uh, over time, it's just, no, don't be, for me, improvisation is the best way to keep myself from getting bored. And if you're bored with the improvisation, then there's a problem. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you know, so it's like a lot of times it's, uh, I don't remember who said this, Bernie said this, or somebody said this, do the most outlandish thing you can, especially with the knowledge of the theory. Because I came from a world of just, just theory, 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 theory. And it's what you do with that over time. People get all hung up on, oh, you're playing minor over a major part. Yeah, people do that. They do that in classical music. Like, well, this is in the key of what? What key? It, it, you know, when I'm playing classical music, the key changes every measure. There's something going on. What key? You know what I mean? So that's where the improvisation comes in to me. What can you find and apply from the world of everything that is correct and just make it as whatever incorrect as you want it to be and, and lead the way? Because then the next guy who has to solo He's gonna be like, he did that thing, that was so to the left. Well, I'm gonna do this. And everybody's like, oh, that thing that you did when you did that patah, that was amazing. Yeah. That's the best thing about the you know, project for me. It's human, it's organic. He was a little bitty boy, you know, and he used to come around backstage and get into all kinds of stuff, you know. But now I look around now, it's 2019, I'm 62 years old, and now I'm able to play with with him, you know, who is a whole nother generation, which gives us a lot of energy. And Danny is the same way. He tells me he used to come see these shows and back in the 80s when he could barely get into shows. And we were doing it, Blackbird and myself, so. But, uh, you know, it's been a great ride. George is announcing his retirement this year and uh, we're playing a lot of places, you know, probably for the last time for him, uh, as far as the road is concerned, because he's, you know, 60 some odd years of getting beat up and, you know, coming out here and attaining it at the level that he does. You know, if, you, if you've seen him perform, you know George is one of those that doesn't like to sit down a lot. And uh, nowadays they, they put a chair on the stage, so, you know, he's been told to at least sit down a portion of the show, which he doesn't. Really. But, you know, he, this is supposed to be his last thing and, and, and we're proud to be a part of it all of these years, and uh, 
you know, keep looking out for different uh, parts of it as it goes on, you know. I know funk will never stop, it'll never die, it'll just continue on because but with the help of hip hop and stuff like that, with the sampling and everything, you'll always keep on hearing it, so. The staying power is the interpretation of what, of what the boss wants. I mean, it's like any job. You can work in a factory or be a teacher. And whoever your superior is, whoever that person is, your best way of interpreting their vibe is how they like you interpreting it is how long you're going to be there. You know what I mean? If, if, if you're not doing it right, to what he wants the interpretation to be, then you might, you might not. And the interpretation might be crazy to everybody else, too. But he likes it. That's the important thing. That's, that's sort of the important thing with that. But it is a controlled madness. I, I do have to say that. There is, there is way more control than there is madness, if that makes sense. So I think that it's attractive to musicians because of the organized part. I think that there's something that, like, wow, the way that they've magically... To, to people, it's magic. It's Ooga Booga. They've weaved this together in whatever kind of way. Or George has weaved this together in whatever kind of way. And uh, I think that is the attractive thing to the to the expert and to the lay person. The chaos is the attractive thing. Time, but uh, <laughs> do one more, one more, one more school. <laughs> it's not a pretty fun gig unless it goes over time. <laughs> Let me do one more for you guys. It's called Biological nice. Speculation. Really nice. By Funkadelic, also from America. It's young. When just a biological speculation Sit me Prince is gone, and Hendrix is gone, and all these people. George really is one of the last greats. Um, and I would just like to know how you feel about this end of an era, because time moves on, and yeah, we've got sampling. <laughs> but when it comes to this organic funk and that combination of chaos and control, is it over? And how do you feel about that? Yes, it's over. No. <laughs> you know, uh, I can only speak for myself. It's just all opinion based or whatever. You know, I, I think that it is whatever you see it to be. You know, uh, you know, what's in the cave? Only what you bring with you. <laughs> it is all. Okay. If you, I think that there's always going to be a cycle. You know, uh, every era of, of jazz was meant to kind of diss and move away from the last era. Classical was the same thing. Funk has existed in, like I was saying at the beginning real briefly, just trying to be real brief with it, but funk existed in a lot of different ways over time. Just to speak on funk specifically, in a lot of different ways over time, that organic funk all the way back before maybe people were calling it that. Or maybe some people were and we've forgotten that. And like all things in history, stuff is forgotten, stuff is retained. The burning of the Library of Alexandria, 
people thought it was the end of thinking as we know it. Thought is over. The Library of Alexandria has burned down. There's no more thought, you know. And of course, you know, the thought would persist and, and things would go on, but maybe not in the same way. I think that with P-Funk, again, this is just me speaking, and you guys please feel free to, to jump in. I think with P-Funk, it's always been sort of a singularity, even when compared to other funk groups. Of course it has things you can connect to everything. You can connect P-Funk to everything from Kiss to Dr. Dre, and from Chopin to, you know what I mean, Erica Badu, or whatever. You can just go on and on and on and find six degrees of separation with P-Funk. And so it's... It's got all of that interconnectivity and very singular in its approach. Maybe you won't see anything like that again, but then something could have come down the line in 50 years, 100 years, 500 years, or sooner, and everybody's be like, how were we alive without, how were we living, how were we even doing music without fill in the blank, dot, 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 whoever this next thing is gonna be. There's always something around the corner, you know, it's always kind of replenishing itself and starting over or, or just completely starting over, retrenching and retooling. I think that's the best way of looking at it, at least the healthiest way of looking at it. Because you look at it as a closed door, that door or just like painted over, everything is never going to come back again. Well, maybe, but that's sort of the special thing about you being there for some part, you know, some, some portion of it. Yeah. 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 Um, I feel like most people that retire usually go back to work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they do. <laughs> and I feel like uh, the difference between a lot of the people that aren't here anymore, they're not here anymore. And uh, George is still here, so I'm sure he's going to do something. And he's going to, they're not going to, they're not going to leave him alone. They're just going to keep coming to the show. All these famous people are showing up, and they're doing that because they want him to keep doing stuff. That's why Red Hot is trying to get him to go on tour and stuff like that, because they are trying to keep him out there some way or other, whether we just do it or, you know, they force him out or whatever, but something in the funk thing is going to continue because there's still a whole lot of us out here that are willing and able to work and still bring that vibe. So the, it's the, about the vibe. We're learning from George and we're just going to probably try to continue the vibe that he's uh, started and we're going to you know try to run with that. So it's our duty at this point. Uh, yeah. The the thing about the question, you know, the phrase "end of an era," you know, that's I can I can hear that, you know, because uh, as far as George, the organic part of it, his funk is different than everybody else's funk. There's a lot of different types of funks out there, funk this, you know, that I, But George has a, a whole nother thing going on, and it's been going on for decades now. But as far as, I wouldn't say end of an era. I know he, you know, he did his thing, and we're all gonna, you know, leave the earth sooner or later, or whatever, but I think, uh, like, five years ago, four years ago, in 015, he changed his band around, you know. Uh, the era changed, you know. He, as you just met, uh, the girls are two of his grandchildren, you know. And he's got a, a concept of it's going to keep on going regardless. Because it's so powerful. Funk, this, this type of thing is, is you, you know, it's not going to stop. Uh, it might be an end of an era. It might be an end of an era as far as what he, the way he did it. But like what Benzel just said, it's gonna keep going because they're gonna. We're all gonna keep on pushing it in some kind of way, whether we're doing it collectively, because he's instilled a lot of it in us. So there's no way it's gonna ever die. So I think you can say end of an era. If you're looking at what he did in his time, but I say a beginning of a new era has started uh, with just the family of P-Funk people that he has around him now. And he started so much, like we just came off the road, we were just here with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And if you know any history about the Peppers, they did a 
they came to George and they did the album Freaky Style. Mm. This is when they first started. They wasn't even famous yet. So they came to him and he said that they're gonna be the next funky, new, baddest shit you ever seen. And at the time when they came to Detroit, they were so punk and so new and so young that they really couldn't play well. And George, you know, you can get away with three chords and punk. You know, so George brought to them, like I said earlier, he's a master at concept. So he brought a whole production to them and they learned how to record, they learned how to write, they learned so much from Mr. Clinton. So at that time, the Peppers, to me, was a new funk thing that was coming out. And this was like in the 80s, you know, they came to Georgia in 1985. So I don't think it's ever gonna end, you know, cause he's put his thing into so many people, so many important people. And a lot of these guys, like the Peppers, for an example, have become stupidly famous. I mean, like huge. So when you look at it like that, I just think it's just the beginning of a, the next chapter of what's going to, to come. So that's where I'm at with it. End of an era, but also a new era that's already started and it's gonna keep going and go, 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 go. <laughs> you know? All right, guys, so I've just finished, I've just come out of the, uh, the uh, Funk Clinic done by the members of P-Funk and man, what, what pretty, pretty cool experience from there. Um, it was interesting to hear about how the uh, musicians actually go about rehearsing their uh, relation, you know, their uh, their approaches to improvisation and stuff like that as well, and just how George Clinton works as a person as well, um, which has always been interesting, you know, because you know you hear about people like James Brown and whatnot, who are Prince, who are really really strict with this stuff, and you would expect that um, you know George Clinton in particular would be a lot more free, you know, a lot more lenient with some sort of stuff, but it just goes to show that you know from what I interpreted from what they were talking about was he he was pretty he was pretty strict in as well. He wasn't you know. Um, uh, well, you know, he, he would, uh, you know, if he wanted something, he would get something. Let's put it that way. If he wanted something, he'd know what to do. And if he couldn't perform to the task, then you were out. So, uh, um, you know, it was it was interesting to see about that. You know, interesting to hear about that. But if, if I could sum up the main things that I got from this clinic, if I could sum it up in three points, three sentences. Um, first of all, like, every, like, you know, everyone who, know, who plays funk knows about the one, all right? But... It, it was interesting to hear about how the musicians themselves were um, focusing more on uh, like funk as a feel, funk as a vibe, as opposed to you know playing something on the one and you know doing syncopations all throughout that sort of thing as well. You know that sort of stuff. Um, so that was one particular thing that was interesting to uh, to hear about. Um, <coughs> another point would be uh, just the fact that you know as much as they don't rehearse as much, they still want to try and rehearse, they still want to play, they're still wanting to do all this extra stuff. Um, which unfortunately for me is not something I have been able to do for a while because, well, let's put it this way, I'm lazy and I procrastinate a lot. So practicing is not something I've been doing very much of over the last probably, uh, yeah, I, I'd say probably eight years. Which is a shame, but you know, it, it's definitely. If I want to be a better musician, then I need to, to do this sort of stuff. I need to actually start practicing more, um, and that's something that's really gotten to me now. Um, I guess another point that, like, one of the main things I got from there was just, uh, yeah, the, the uh, particularly the end of an era segment that they were, that everyone was talking about towards the end of the uh, towards the end of the um, workshop, I guess, if you want, you know, the end of the clinic was, you know, even though George Clinton at this current time is, you know, he, obviously he's in his, he, he is past his prime, he is old, he is, you know, reaching the end of his life, but his visions, his mentality, his approaches to things, and the, just the, um, the legacy that he is passing on to his family, his friends, uh, to, you know, the global fans and everything like that who are still continuing to play 
um, P-Funk music and just funk music in general, you know? With the amalgamation of all these different genres putting in, just put into one. Um, to come out as a to come out as a funky dancey sort of you know movement or like a cultural experience from there it's um you know it's not an end of an era as the uh, bass player said it's it's it, it's more of a beginning of a new era where the next generation will start picking things up and they will continue on with that legacy so you know knowing that you know it, it, it I guess you know, it fills me with determination, I guess, if you want to put it that way, if you wanted to quote Undertale. Um, but yeah, it's it's it was a wonderful experience. It was great to actually go out and actually just see musicians, professional musicians again. You know, well, not so much professional, but more well experienced, like heavily experienced musicians. Those who have toured around the world and played so much of so many different things and worked with legendary people. That is something, like, as much as I've played with different musicians who have gone from varying degrees of, you know, amateur to professional and, you know, who play all these different type of gigs and have gone overseas and everything like that, it's the fact that, you know, play, you know, meeting and seeing these particular people who were so honest with their, um, so honest with their, in, you know, their interpretations, so honest with their expressions and stuff like that as well, with the way that they live, the way that they rehearse the way that they perform and you know internalize and interpret things it's yeah it's it it's making me feel good it's making me really want to create it makes me want to it makes me want to play bass we, and isn't that what isn't that what you know doing this stuff is all about it, you know doesn't it want to make you create something new does it want to make you um exp you know express all these feelings and create something out of nothing to create you know, an, an extension, an extension of you. I think, and that's what that's what brings me to music. That's why I play music in particular. And you know, the funk, funk music as well. As much as, um, as much as you know, I don't really play it as often as I normally would. It's still embedded in me. It's been embedded in me since birth. You know, with my with my parents. Um, playing, you know, with my parents being into Motown and Northern Soul and stuff like that back in England, um, and then you know, growing up with musicians, growing growing up listening to musicians who were influenced by funk and stuff like that, you know, you know David Bowie and whatnot. Um, it was, uh, and you know, being a huge fan of the Red Hot Chili Peppers as well for pretty much most of my life, you know, for a good twenty, at least twenty-seven years, possibly twenty-eight years now of this recording, being a big fan of them. It's, um, you know, and it being obviously being a bass player as well, where, you know, it's, it's something where, you know, as a bass, I can express myself through, you know, by playing funk and stuff like that too. It's, um, yeah, it makes, it's, you know, I, I feel as, as white as I am, <laughs> even though that shouldn't really be a point, but as white as I am and, you know, as Australian or as, you know, as straight as I can be, um, in terms of personality, straight to the point sort of thing, you know, I feel the funk is in me and it's something that I am proud to have and it's something I really do want to, uh, it's something I really do want to focus on, I want to bring out a lot more, especially with these recordings now, even though I've already got plans for one of my recordings, I've already got plans for my album, which is very rock-centric sort of stuff, you know, doesn't mean I can't add a little funk to it, you know, there's always a little bit of pieces here and there, you know, the songs like All That I Know, um, which was an idea that I grabbed it, in, you know, I would say that that is a bit of a funk song itself, incorporates a lot of rock, incorporate, it actually incorporates a bit of serialism as well, so a little bit of classical, um, and it doesn't focus on just, you know, major or minor scales or anything like that, it does actually work within modes and stuff like that too, so, you know, it's it's a little, you know, if you want to put something a little off-center in terms of key structure and whatnot, um, yeah, just something I want to, it's, it's, you know, the funk is within me, and after seeing this sort of thing, it's going to come out, and it wants to come out, and I'm going to be nurturing it, and I'm going to be making sure that, uh, yeah, it's refined, that it's basically worth everyone's while, and it's going to make me a better musician from there. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this sort of stuff. And we'll see how things go from there.
day. Enjoy yourselves, everyone. We're in the list out. <laughs>